So what we saw in the uh, in the previous lecture, and I, I would again advise you to uh, actually go through uh, for yourself uh, the various details. And actually, there are three of you in, in taking this course, or actually taking the course on money body physics. And you, the three of you, I mean, that's Milad, Roger, and, and Henrik, you've gone through the details here. So in case you have questions and we are not able to resolve them during these uh, uh, lectures, I mean, you could ask Milad or Henrik and, and Roger about the some more technicalities. But I, I, the thing I wanted to say is that the, the, uh, uh, the derivation of this specific quantity is extremely useful. Because when we set up the, uh, the calculation of the, of the Slater determinant, it's actually, uh, uh, it's actually uh, easy to make errors. So let's now look at the technicalities. So uh, last time, uh, Hover asked, uh, why do we uh, uh, move only one electron at a time? Why don't we move many electrons and then actually do the uh, the uh, metropolis test after we have moved all electrons. Now, one of the reasons why we do that is actually that uh, moving one electron at a time is going to give us a very efficient algorithm for computing the Slater determinant. So the Slater determinant is the, the more time-consuming part. So I'm going to give you some of the mathematical details which are needed uh, to encode the Slater determinant. Now, when we are going to do this uh, 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 numerically now, uh, I would advise you to actually do the brute force way of calculating the Slater determinant for the beryllium atom first. So, let me give you some definitions. So, I'm going to call the Slater determinant for matrix D, and the matrix elements, and this is where it's easy to make errors when we actually do the computations, so I will have an index J for the quantum numbers and an index I for the specific single particle position. So when you do the uh, uh, beryllium atom, you will have quantum numbers 1s will spin up, 1s will spin down, 2s will spin up, and 2s will spin down. So for the beryllium atom, you will have a matrix with four particles and four single particle states. So that's a four by four matrix. Now we come back to the expression for that one. Now this uh, uh, phi j here is now the single particle wave function and this single particle wave function is the, in our case, the eigenstate of a hydrogen-like problem. So that means that the, uh, this forms an orthonormal basis and we know the eigenvalues of H0. So you can, you can uh, obviously uh, interchange uh, these indices, but then you have to keep track of what is what. So what we need to do now, uh, and it's uh, one of the things which will take a lot of time is actually the computation of derivatives. So we need an efficient way to compute the derivatives. So we need the first derivative when we compute this so-called quantum force. And then we need the second derivative when we compute the local energy. So to take derivatives of determinants is sometimes uh, uh, needs a little bit thinking. So uh, what we need to realize is that when, when we differentiate a Slater determinant with respect to some given coordinate, there's only one row of the corresponding Slater determinant, the Slater matrix, which is changed. So by recalculating the whole determinant, we may actually risk to produce redundant information. Now we have, however, an algorithm which actually uh, uses properties of the determinant. So let me give you some of these properties. You know that the uh, uh, determinant, when we calculate it by hand using Kramer's rule, is written as the product of the cofactors. So if you have a three by three determinant, you have three such cofactors. So every cofactor then is a two times two determinant. I hope that rings a bell. So uh, 
we need also the inverse of the determinant. And that can actually be expressed in terms of the inverse matrix elements, this dij, because we are going to take uh, in the uh, metropolis test, we will need ratios between determinants. And that is also something which makes life a little bit more complicated. So I guess you, do you remember what a cofactor is? When you set up determinant, think of a free by free determinant, right? So then you, you look at one of the columns, and then when you're writing out the determinant, you will actually have three cofactors, and the three cofactors are two by two determinants. So, uh, we will assume that the determinant is, uh, has an inverse, and that uh, uh, the, this uh, relation here is obeyed. Or if we just look at that in terms of the different uh, elements, it means that we have to obey re this relation here. Now, the tricky part, which we uh, have to deal with, one of the tricky parts, so there are two more. One is the calculation of the first derivative, and the other one is the calculation of the second derivative. So one part which causes problems for us is uh, the metropolis test. So the metropolis test involves the ratio between two determinants in the old position and the new position. So if I now look at the determinant, uh, the determinant is simply the matrix element we have picked times the cofactor. Is this a form you are familiar with? So think again of a free by free determinant. So you would pick a specific uh, uh, column, and that specific column element is multiplied, in case of a free by free determinant, it's multiplied with a two by two determinant. And the two by two determinant is called the cofactor. So it's a sum of the individual matrix elements times the various cofactors. If you have a four by four determinant, this would obviously be the given matrix elements times a free times free determinant, which is the cofactor for the four by four matrix. So the cofactor has always a, a dimension which is n minus one times n minus one. So that means that uh, if we set this up in a brute force way, and we use what is called Cramer's rule to calculate the determinant, this is the way we would write the ratios between two determinants. And clearly, if we now are doing this, every determinant is something like n cubed operations. So we would have n cubed here, n cubed here, and if we move n particles, this becomes like n to the power of four operations. And this is not very efficient. So, uh, if we move one particle at a time, so this is the, uh, to realize the recipe, we have to uh, uh, look at the, uh, the change in the determinant. So when we move one particle at a time, that means that uh, this uh, new position differs from the old one. But if you have been moving the particle i, there's only one column which has changed its value. So let me show you that. Let's, let's look at this case with beryllium. So for the beryllium atom, if I move this electron, electron 1, it's only this column which changes its value. These three other columns, they stay unchanged. Okay? So let's go back again to the more formal thing. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the, uh, the only thing we, we, can, we need to think of then, so that means that the new position and the new slated determinant and the old one differ only by the entries of the i-throw. 
Now, the point now is that the ith row of a cofactor matrix C is independent of the entries of this ith row. Let me show you what this means. Let's go back to this determinant. So, remember now that when I compute the determinant, so what is the cofactor? So, these are the matrix elements. So, if I have this element here, the cofactor is determined by this specific set of elements. So, I have to multiply this specific matrix element with a free by free determinant, right? And now what you see is that the cofactor is not changed. Because I'm moving particle 1 here. So this specific element is multiplied with this determinant. This element two, element 2 here in this column has a cofactor which is determined by the first row here, the third row, and the fourth row. And you see again that all these elements, they are unchanged. Now, the third cofactor is multiplied with this specific element, and the third cofactor contains this row, this row, and that row. Does that ring a bell when it comes to the definition of cofactors? So what you see now is that the cofactors are unchanged, and that's quite interesting. So, if we now go back here, what we see is that uh, we can now say that the cofactors for the new position are the same as the old. So, when I'm looking at this expression here, what I have now is the following. This is unchanged, the cofactor. This is unchanged. This is unchanged. This is the only thing which changes. Because I'm moving one particle at a time. In, in, this, uh, yeah. in this line, the, the index i is undetermined, right? But you can yeah. choose like arbitrary because it's like you get oh, the yeah. determinant. Yeah. And, they, and you could, in theory, just use a different i in the enumerator than in the denominator. Yeah. 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 I guess it makes no, no sense for yeah. what you yeah. Okay. Exactly. So, so this, this should, the, the i and j should be different numbers, right? Eh? No, different, uh, different indices. Yeah, but you sum over j, but the i is just something you can choose actually. Yes, if you want. yes, yes. So what does that mean? Well, that means the following. Uh, what I can do now, if, if I look at the uh, definitions of the uh, inverse matrix elements. So I have uh, this definition here of the inverse matrix elements. And they are defined in terms of the cofactors divided by the determinant. I don't need to compute the determinant because I'm taking a ratio. So that means that I can now replace the uh, cofactor with the inverse in the old position. The cofactor here is again the inverse in the old position. This expression here. If I look at that one, what you have in the numerator here, in the, sorry, in the denominator, is simply equal to 1, if i is equal to j. So that means that I'm left with the inverse matrix element in the old position, and then the new one. And the new one is simply the wave function, which has been updated. So that means that the uh, ratio which is needed in the metropolis algorithm now simplifies to this expression here. So what I did now is to simply plug in the new state, the new wave function, the, the, the new position in, in the, uh, in the so, so this dij is simply the wave function which I'm looking at, the single particle wave function. So this is something which I have a program for. Like when you've been doing this for the helium atom, you have something which goes like e to the uh, e to the power of minus alpha times some r. So it's a very simple closed form expression. 
And then uh, the, uh, the uh, thing you need to compute is actually this quantity. So we need only to compute uh, the dot product of the vector uh, of a single particle wave functions evaluated at this new position with the ith column of the inverse matrix uh, evaluated at the original position. Now, this operation here has a scaling of uh, which goes like n, the number of particles. So the thing we need to do is actually to maintain the inverse matrix. Now, there is an updating algorithm for this one also, which is very compact and which will save us quite some CPU time. So this is one of the first steps. So uh, I will only sketch the algorithm here. I, have, uh, I will give you some derivations when we, when we meet for the uh, intensive week. I'm going to show you the uh, final derivations for the algorithm because I need to do this on the blackboard. I mean, to show you the final, so what, what I'm going to do now is simply to give you the algorithm for updating the uh, column of the inverse, the ith column of the inverse uh, ma Slater matrix here. So the derivation needs some, uh, some, uh, some 20 minutes on the blackboard. And uh, I'm a little bit handicapped with the slides here. And I would like to actually to repeat these things when we meet, so that you uh, get things properly. So what you need to compute, uh, what we need to compute is actually this quantity. And the new elements of the JF column of this uh, inverse matrix can actually be determined in terms of this quantity which you see here. So I'm just giving you the algorithms, and then we will do the derivations properly when we have the, uh, the, uh, the, the week when we meet. <coughs> and uh, the elements uh, can then be updated in a very simple way, where this r is just the ratio which we looked at before. So the r here is uh, this particular ratio here. So this would be the new uh, matrix elements, the new inverse matrix elements. So the, the scaling of uh, the update of the inverse matrix after changing one row runs like O to the power of n squared instead of n cubed. And this is a uh, saving of CPU time of uh, a uh, one order magnitude in n. And that really saves a lot of CPU time. Now, there's something else we have to think of here. And that deals with the uh, ratios which involve derivatives. Because we will have a derivative for the uh, quantum force, and we will have a deriv second derivative for the local energies. And uh, again, what you will see is that the uh, uh, to calculate the derivatives, the first derivatives of the Slater determinant and the second derivative with respect to the coordinates of a single particle Ra, that changes only the ith row of the corresponding matrix. So, uh, when we calculate the local energy, this is the quantity we need for the local energy, and this is the quantity we need also for the local energy and the quantum force. Mm -hmm. So this is a ratio between two Slater determinants. And actually, what you can show is that the gradient and the Laplacian can be simply written out in terms of this inverse matrix. So when we are now going to calculate the quantum force, the only thing we need to calculate is this quantity. And when we want to calculate the second derivative, we need only to calculate this quantity here. So. What will be uh, important to do now is the following. Uh, we are going to have closed form expressions for all these single particle wave functions. So it can be useful to write a class which is called single particle wave functions, where you have the closed form expression for uh, the different single particle states which are involved, the closed form expressions for the first derivative, 
and the closed form expressions for the second derivative. Because we will typically use uh, uh, single particle wave functions which are determined from the solution of some single particle Hamiltonian. So this could be a harmonic oscillator, it could be uh, our hydrogen-like wave function, or some other single particle potential plus kinetic energy which gives us wave functions appropriate for the physical case we are looking at and which have a closed form expression. Now, uh, Jürgen is going to give you a demonstration on uh, how to extract uh, expressions like this using symbolic Python. Are you familiar with symbolic Python? SymPy, it's the uh, name of it. But most of you have been programming in Python. So Jürgen will give you a quick demonstration on how you, because symbolic Python, there are actually people who have included packages of hydrogen-like wave functions, the harmonic oscillator wave functions, and many other types of wave functions used in physics and, and chemistry. And then from uh, symbolic Python, you can extract the wave function, the derivatives, and symbolic Python allows you also to spit out the C++ code for those derivatives. Because when you have uh, many terms in these uh, wave functions, it's very easy to make a small error. It's very easy to forget some uh, R or some constants or whatever. So symbolic Python is a very useful tool, and Jürgen will give you a demonstration at the lab on how to use symbolic Python to extract these expressions. But obviously, you can, uh, you can go and look up in any text in quantum mechanics, and if you go to your uh, quantum mechanics course, the advanced one, you uh, have most likely solved the hydrogen atom. And these textbooks normally include the closed form expressions for these wave functions. But this is something you have to think of when you're structuring your code. In order to have an efficient code for calculating these derivatives. Because these are expressions which you will calculate many, many times. So you have to think of how to... Yeah, over. Yeah. Uh, what about, this is only the single particle part of the wave. Yeah. Function. yeah. What about the, the other just one term? Yeah, that comes in addition. So, you remember, I, I just have it in the slides here, it just comes quickly now. Because we have to, let me, let me just skip this one. Let, let me, let me, <laughs> let me give you. So, when we are calculating, let me try to answer what you asked. So, suppose you calculate the uh, kinetic energy. So, this is the quantity you need to calculate. Now, your answers for the wave function contains the determinant and the Jasso factor. So, that means that when you compute the second derivative here, you need actually to compute all these ratios. So, there will be one ratio which involves only the Slater determinant, like this. One ratio which includes only the Jasso factor and then the mixed ratios. So when you calculate the uh, uh, quantum force, you need this quantity. When you calculate the Laplacian, you need everything here. So that means you need to add this piece, you need to have this times that, and you need this one. So now I'm just looking at the determinant part. So what we did now was to pick this piece and that piece. And let me just remind you of some of the things we discussed uh, last time. When you look at the uh, at the Jastrow factor, there we have a close. This is our Jastrow factor, which includes the correlations between two electrons, which are not included in the Slater determinant. So the Slater determinant does not produce these types of correlations. So that piece has a closed form expression, which looks like that. So this is again something which we can. Uh, uh, set up in a closed form in our code. Obviously, what you could do is you could calculate the derivatives numerically, but that uh, is something which uh, makes you use more CPU time to do the computations. So, what it means then is that if we look at uh, this ratio and this ratio, that is something we can calculate. That's one, one of the pieces we need. And that is given by this expression and this expression. So, what I would suggest to you is that when you are adding the uh, 
Slater determinant to your program, leave out the Jastrow factor first. Just make sure that the Slater determinant part is implemented correctly. Because if you want to plug in everything, I can guarantee you that somewhere you will make some stupid errors. There can be some coefficients here which are interchanged. We are picking the wrong elements. You have made a little error when you coded the uh, derivative of the, of the uh, single particle wave functions and so forth. It's very easy to make small errors. So then it's uh, better that just to leave out the Slater, the uh, Jastrow part, and test the uh, calculation of the energy without the Coulomb interaction. Because there you have an exact answer you have to reproduce. So if you get that, that means that your Slater determinant part is functioning properly. So it's devising all these kind of strategies which is important when we develop programs. Strategies where we include various tests which can be made. Actually, that is often the most difficult part in developing a program, to devise proper tests. Okay, let me skip this part and let's go back to the determinant. Now, there is a kind of subtlety here, which is, uh, is something uh, uh, we actually have to, uh, to think of. Now, the energy is non-zero, so keep that in mind, with this function. So, if we go back a little bit uh, and look at the expression which we calculated here with that specific determinant, this quantity is not zero. However, there's a problem here. If we look at the determinant, which we have here, it's okay, this is spin up and spin down, that lives in its own space. But the spatial part is the same. So the spatial, when the spatial part of the wave function is the same, it means that we will have a uh, wave function here where we can have elements, where we have two elements which are equal. And that will give us a zero determinant. So that sounds very strange. So what is normally done is that if we look at the determinant, we can rewrite it when we write it out as a product of two times two determinants. One where we have only spin up, so this will be only the spin up part, and one where we have the spin down part. Now when we do all these additions, this is still equal to zero. But the energy is not. So what you can show, and uh, this is something I, I want to give you as a small exercise, uh, is that you can, instead of writing the determinant out fully, you can write it out as the product of a determinant with spin up only for particle one and two, and a determinant with spin down only with particle three and four. So that means that you pick uh, this part, so you can reduce the four by four determinant to a two, two times two determinants. One which involves only a spin off or spin up, and one which only involves the spin down part. You can do this. So that means that when we look at the beryllium, we have two determinants, one which includes only the spin up part, and one for the spin down. When we go to neon, which is one of the cases we have to look at, there will be two five times five determinants. Now, the problem here is that the ANSAT is not symmetric under the exchange of electrons with opposite spins, but we get the same expectation value for the energy as long as the Hamiltonian is spin independent. So, what I want you to do now is the following. Uh, this is a simple exercise. If you take this expression for the, energy, for the determinant, so you write it out in terms of uh, one spin up part and one spin down part, then you go back to the calculation of the, so instead of having a 4 times 4 determinant for beryllium, you now go back and you calculate these two expectation values. This expectation value here, and this expectation value here, 
And what you will see is as long as V, the interaction here, does not depend on spin, you will get exactly the same energy as we had here. So this is a small exercise uh, I want to give you. So the wave function, when we, the way we treat it now, is not fully anti-symmetric, but the energy becomes the same, as long as the interaction is not spin-dependent. So I will leave that as a small exercise. And this is the standard way these calculations are run uh, for fermions. OK, there's another thing I want you to, uh, to think of. Because if you look at the, the expression here, which you have, the simplest possible way to implement the calculations for beryllium is simply to write out these two by two determinants. So now, when you have been running the calculations for, for helium, you have a single particle part of the wave function. So what you do now is that you replace that single particle piece with just the product of two, two times two determinants. So instead of writing a function which calculates the determinant, you take the closed form expressions for these uh, single particle wave functions and simply multiply these two guys with each other. And a two by two slated determinant is something which is just one line of code. That's not very complicated. Do you agree on that? So that is a brute force way of doing it. Before you start calling functions to compute a determinant. So if then your program gives you the correct single particle energies, then you're fine. The expectation value of H0. So do the, this as a first test before you do any sophisticated calculation of the slated determinant. Just change your program. It's a question of changing some few lines, where instead of having e to the minus alpha of r i, you now simply multiply these two functions and these two functions. And then you just place particle 1, and you have particle 2, and then you have a similar for particle 3 and particle 4. So that's a very simple way of uh, running calculations for the beryllium atom. It's not a big change of your program. The only thing you have to change also, now the other thing you have to change is obviously the charge, set equal to 4. And then you have also to uh, uh, obviously run over 4 particles instead of 2 particles. But that's the only change. So if you've written the program fairly in a fairly general way for the helium atom, you sum over four electrons instead of two, and then you change your single particle piece to just be the product of these two single particle wave functions. Yeah? Do you use the same variation parameters for the... Yes. Uh, yeah, that's... Uh, you, you, yeah. Can, you, can, you can put different variational parameters. You can do that. And some people do that. But we will stick with the same variational parameters. But you could, you could add, in principle, what many people do is actually to add more variational parameters. But we can, as a first approximation, we can just run with the same parameter. So if you want to change, uh, have a, a different variational parameter here, you would end up with a calculation uh, with two parameters if you take away the just factor. So, so what I'm trying to uh, convince you to do now is actually to make this kind of stepwise development into more complicated systems. Because the one thing is to reproduce the expectation value of this H0. Uh, and you can do that in this very brute force way. But then the next step is to actually compute the determinant using that recipe which I gave you. So in the slides here, what I've done is now to, uh, uh, to put up this specific recipe. And what you have to keep in mind also is uh, which slate the determinant you're updating. So, your slated determinant is now the product of one with spin up and one with spin down. So if you're moving just the, uh, suppose in beryllium particle one and two, it's only this part we see which is unchanged. And that means that this part is not changed. So this saves you also calculations. 
because instead of doing a 4 by 4 determinant, you're doing a 2 by 2 in this case. And uh, in for the beryllium case, if you're moving particle 1 or 2, it's this part which now is changed, and this is left unchanged. So that saves some CPU operations. Yeah, I, I leave this uh, this slide here. Something you can you can read afterwards. Actually, I will I will just skip some of these slides here. I mean, they are not so. You can you can just look at them for yourself. That's not so important. So what I do here uh, is to set up the uh, uh, the the updating algorithm which you need in case j is different from i, in case j is equal to i. And we will go through the derivation of this uh, algorithm here when we uh, when we meet. Now, uh, so the the whole point now is to avoid uh, doing the Gaussian elimination, which is needed to calculate the Slater determinant every time we move a particle. Now, another thing uh, we can do as an intermediate step, instead of implementing this algorithm you can simply actually calculate in a brute force a determinant every time. But for the beryllium atom, this is not so difficult because it's only a 2 by 2 matrix. So this goes very fast. So instead of uh, implementing this algorithm first, what you could do is actually to call a function which calculates the determinant for you and simply calculate it every time you move the particle. And uh, you may remember uh, let me just remind you of the codes which we have. So uh, the way you would calculate the determinant is just to use the standard LU decomposition. And for those of you who took physics 3150, who have taken that one, uh, there is a function uh, in back in the lectures it described in chapter 6 of the lecture from 2012. And the function is called LU decomposition in uh, the file libcpp. So the only thing you need to do is to call this function and that uh, you need to transfer the matrix and its dimensionality and then you get back an LU decomposed matrix. And then you know that when you have the LU decomposed matrix, so an LU dec this is just to remind you of uh, what you've seen before, if you have an LU decomposed matrix you can write it in terms of a lower triangular matrix and an upper triangular matrix. And now since this is specified to be equal to 1, this is one of the standard algorithms which is used to decompose a matrix in a lower and upper uh, factorization scheme, then the determinant is simply the product of the matrix elements along the diagonal here. Because all the cofactors which you end up with, uh, they uh, tend to zero out, so that means that the only thing which is left is just the product of matrix elements along the diagonal. So it's a very simple recipe to calculate the determinant. But you need to perform an LU decomposition of the matrix. So one possibility now, before you implement this uh, uh, algorithm which you see here, is simply to call the LU decomposition at every stage. For beryllium, the reason why we have to chosen beryllium is it's one, it's, uh, it's, nice, it's a nice test to case against experiment. And two, the system is so small that we can actually do many brute force calculations before we implement the fully sophisticated algorithm. So there are actually three, there are three layers now. The first layer is simply to calculate in a brute force way this uh, determinants and multiply them. The next step is to remove this brute force right out of the determinant and call the LU decomposition algorithm and get the matrix in uh, in the uh, from from the and get the, the determinant from the LU decomposition. And then the final step is to implement the optet algorithm. And you can look at the speed up and and you will when you look at the speed up, you, you will actually see that this algorithm is much faster. So there are three steps. And it's useful to go through the different three steps. Because normally what we want to do is actually to solve the fancy problem immediately. 
but then it's easy to make errors. I can guarantee you that this. Okay, so what I've done here is to uh, to set up some specific uh, subtasks. So you need to think a little bit now uh, how you want to structure the code because we are adding a layer of complexity to the helium atom case. And this means some administration. So what you need to think of now is to split things into subtasks. So you could have one class where you just have the single particle wave functions and where you compute the derivatives, second derivatives, and so forth. And having such a class can actually allow you to extend your code to other physical systems. You could look at quantum dots, or you could go to a nuclei, or other systems uh, where you have fermions involved. You can look at different external potentials. Uh, you may need to think whether the operations you do on Rij and the correlation functions is something you can split out in a specific subtask or a specific class. And then you have uh, mathematical operations like the first and second derivatives of the trial wave functions. There are some matrix and vector operations which you need to think of. So the first thing I would like you to focus on is actually the single particle wave functions because that is something you need to deal with now when you deal with these determinants. So uh, I would advise you not to include the just factor though, when you now start implementing this Slater determinant. So, and I would have advise you again also to hard code the two by two determinant, because that is a simple test. And it's very simple to do uh, this two by two determinant. It's just some few lines of code. Yeah, this is just to remind you a little bit of the expressions which we need to, to compute. So I just leave that, uh, that here because this is a kind of summary of the things you you need to uh, include at the end when you also want to include the just factor. So, so what you see, I mean, the expressions are laid out, uh, but you need to uh, think about how you want to administrate all this information. And this is obviously something which uh, we do better when we go to the lab. So this terminates uh, this lecture. We are going to bring everything up again when we meet. So the first day when we meet, we will uh, repeat this uh, Slater determinant discussion. And then we will uh, move on to uh, the discussion of uh, blocking, which is a uh, efficient numerical algorithm, which allows us to compute uh, the covariance and the standard deviation in a satisfactory way. Because till now we have been very sloppy with the, the definition of the standard deviation. And then we need to automatize this optimization of the parameters, the variational parameters, alpha, beta, and so on. And that means that we have to search for the minimum in a multivariable space. Mm -hmm. And the methods which are normally used in that case uh, belong to the category of conjugate gradient methods. And uh, that brings in uh, uh, some numerical uh, algorithms which are very useful uh, for other purposes as well. Because often in science we end up searching for minima of multivariable functions. So there will be three main topics when we meet in the beginning of March. So the Slater determinant calculation, the uh, proper statistical evaluation of the error, and search for minima in multivariable spaces. And my hope is that we can have all these elements implemented before we reach Easter. And then we have uh, what you can call a professional variational Monte Carlo program which is actually a state-of-the-art Monte, Monte Carlo calculation. As people, as people have when they actually do production calculations in variational Monte Carlo calculations. So my hope is that 
If we are able to achieve that, then you have uh, written a professional Monte Carlo code for doing variational Monte Carlo in the span of two and a half months, which is not bad. Questions? You need to look at some of the details, the mathematical details for computing the determinants. And uh, I would also advise you, in case you have questions, I mean, send me an email or send also, or discuss also with Sigve, Sara, Carl, and, uh, and Svenane, because they have all implemented these things. So they have a detailed knowledge on how to do it. Okay. No questions? Good. It just remains me to wish you a nice day. <laughs>